following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm your host, Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading, and I am joined today by Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today, Jim and Ben will be discussing higher rates. Inflation expectations are bubbling over and the U.S. 10-year yields are back to 1.6%. Yes, yet the S&P 500 makes new highs. What gives? Ben, let's start with you. Sure. So we saw, you know, in February, we saw the, the race to higher yields start to kind of matter. Um, well, in, on an intraday basis, we saw 10-year note futures and S&P 500 E-minis, for example, their intraday correlations kind of lost the negative correlation we're used to that kind of helps the 60-40 portfolio. And that's somewhat persisted through today, but not to the degree that it's actually impaired uh, equity markets. And so, you know, the S&P 500 continues to make new records. Econ data is improving and markets don't seem concerned as of yet with the rise in yields. Now we haven't seen real yields punch that much higher. 10-year yields broke out a little bit in a real basis. Uh, but we really, really need to see that get going, I think, to get th concerns higher. So maybe it'll be one and three quarters, maybe it'll be 2%, I don't know. But what I can say and what we'll get into with Jim is that it appears investors are, in the bond market at least, are kind of looking further back in time and really tracking what's happened in higher inflation scenarios in relation to the rise in yields. Since uh, November, we've seen yields up about 80 basis points or so. Um, it's one of the best uh, performances in terms of yields, I should say worst performances for the 10-year note uh, since really 1994, looking at six-month breakouts in yields, which is which is quite impressive. And, and really, if you do look back in time at global recoveries, um, and we can define that by looking at OECD composite leading indicators that say that we want 50 plus percent of them above trend, which is something we're going to do likely this month. What happens? Well, typically before 1995, when, when we had higher inflation scenarios, um, we get these troughs in global growth. They just rebound and core inflation, sticky core inflation would always rebound quite appreciably. We lost that post 1995. But if you look at what the 10-year note yield is doing right now, based on this global recovery, let's go back six months from six months prior, um, which would bring us back to essentially September of last year and look at the move, we're up about 100 basis points in the 10-year note. Now that's only happened during these higher inflation scenarios that occurred, for example, in 77, 83, 86, 93 and so on. So we're on that track. So I think investors are sniffing that something's a little bit different here going forward. Here, I'll, I'll stop talking so much and turn it to Jim here. Well, thanks, Ben. <laughs> I agree with you. You know, there, there's an old adage in the bond market that uh, yields will continue to rise, either the front end with the Fed rate raising or the back end until something breaks. Uh, now that something breaks can be a, a myriad of things. It can be markets break, it could be the economy breaks, it could be Fed policy breaks, and that they force a change in Fed policy um, right now. I think what the markets were worried about last week when we broke through 150 in the 10-year note was we were getting close to that something breaks. <clears throat> now, as we get close to 160, all of a sudden, we're not worried that something's going to break. And this is kind of common for markets to do this. You know, they get obsessed about something, and then it gets worse, and then they don't care about it anymore. Um, as well too. So that's not unusual, but I think there's two things going on. One, I think that there's a perception, we're recording on Tuesday, uh, the 16th. Uh, tomorrow is the Fed meeting. There's a perception that the Fed will do something to ameliorate the, the conditions in the market. Now, do something is not that they're gonna change policy. There will be no change in policy. 
It's that they will announce some kind of a technical of change, either a relaxation of the supplementary leverage rules or the SLR or something along those lines that give banks more flexibility to own bonds, that will give people a reason to stop worrying about the bond market. So that's one thing that people are, are, are looking at. And we'll see whether or not that happens. You'll know by the time you hear this podcast whether or not that comes to pass. The other thing I think that's been going on with the markets in general is the whole inflation story. You don't need to dissect the CPI data right now. I'll, I'll save you the trouble. There is no inflation right now in the data. If you look at it currently as it exists, the inflation story is about two things. First, there's going to be a base effect in the next few months. As you roll off March, February, March, maybe April of last year on the year over year change, we expect the core CPI numbers, the core PC numbers, we being everybody, not just me specifically, uh, <clears throat> to spike to near two and a half percent, which would be about a 26, 27 year high. Then the question is, what happens with the economy in the second half of the year? What happens with inflation in the second half of the year? I'll give you one quick antidote. This morning, we reported February retail sales. February retail sales, the control group came out at minus 2.7%. And that was a big disappointment. But then what was Wall Street's reaction? The number is irrelevant because yesterday, President Biden came out in a, in a, uh, a prepared remarks and said that in the next week, $100 million, $1,400 checks will be mailed out in the next week. So the question is, who cares what the February retail sales say? Tell me what April and May are going to look like when everybody gets that money. Add to that, Tell me what inflation is going to be in the second half of the year, because once everybody gets inoculated and we start to reopen and their, and their pockets are full of money, will we see inflation in the summer and in the fall? So the market's bet here is there's going to be a base effect and then we're going to reopen and we've stuffed everybody full of money. Will we see inflation at that point? We don't have it now. So I'm not surprised that the stock market somewhat vacillates back and forth between the rise in rates is a big deal because it signals inflation. The rise in rates doesn't matter because it signals real growth and it doesn't signal inflation. And they'll probably continue to vacillate back and forth. One last thought for you, Ben, on your comment about you know pre-95, post-95. 95 in this regard was an important year. 95 was the year that Windows 95 came out. And Bill Gates, in my opinion, made one of the greatest business decisions ever. He rolled out Windows 95. It was a massive success um, on every measure. And then six months after they rolled it out, he went into a board meeting at Microsoft and he said, forget this operating system thing. We have to move towards the internet. It's new, it's big, it's gonna change everything. And, he got a lot of pushback at Microsoft. What do you mean? We got the most successful operating system ever. It's minting us money. And you're saying we have to ditch it after six months? He was 100% right on that call. Like I said, one of the greatest business calls, I think, ever. And that was the beginning of the period of the T in DGT, which is demographics, globalization, and technology to really help depress inflation. In fact, if you look at a lot of the inflation numbers, You'll see <clears throat> they're around the mid 90s. They came down a lot and they've stayed down a lot as well, too. So, if we are going to see inflation because of all this stimulus start to act like a pre 95 period, it's almost like we're saying that we're going to offset the entire inflation um, dynamic that we've had with, uh, or the, excuse me, the entire de de technology dynamic we've had and holding down inflation. Now, to be clear, pre-95, don't confuse that with the late 70s. You didn't have out of control inflation, but you did have much higher inflation because you didn't have that deflationary push down from technology. So that's what's kind of interesting when you brought up in your, in your charts and in, in your studies, that 95 pivot point, because that's really when technology kicked in. And if we're gonna go back to a pre-technology pre type of response, in the market, that I think is significant if that's indeed what we see continuing to happen as we move forward.
Well, next, our next question for today is, are bond investors getting ahead of themselves? When do you, when do you foresee inflation running persistently higher? I'll go with that. No, I don't think they're getting ahead of themselves. I just think that, <clears throat> as I said before, when you get into a period where the market is not discounting what is, is happening now, it's betting on a significant change is about to occur because of the reopening and all the stimulus. That is an understandable argument. Now, maybe it's wrong. It could very well be wrong that we could have a reopening without much in the way of inflation. And then the bond market will probably see a big rally and we'll see yields come down a lot. Or maybe we do see inflation. And remember, Inflation can take on two different forms. Form one that inflation can take on is just uh, everybody marks up prices uh, because <clears throat> we have a shortage of stuff. Form two, which we've been seeing more and more of, is in supply shortages. Um, at the retail level, there's a lot of supply shortages and it's really mostly anecdotal. I talked to somebody who's remodeling their kitchen and bought a, um, a dishwasher and they got the good deal on the dishwasher with the rebates and stuff, and they signed up for it, they paid for it, swiped the credit card, uh, you'll get it in seven months. Because they're rationing them. Because they're, the, they're unwilling to raise their prices. This was at Lowe's. They're unwilling to raise their prices because everybody's been taught not to ever raise prices. So instead, we sell them at these cheap prices, but we have to ration them now. You have to wait a long time to get it. So that's the other form of inflation that you can see as we move forward from here. But if you see inflation, I think then the bond market was right. If you don't see it and we see a big rally in the bond market, as I've argued, then there was no consequence to just mailing out three sets of checks and other stimulus that we might be coming on. So where's the fourth and the fifth check? Why wouldn't there be a fourth and fifth check if there's not any consequence? Yeah, I agree. I don't think bond investors are, are getting ahead of themselves. If you look at risk assets in general, I don't care if it's you know it's liquidity, it's volatility, it's equities, and use them and put together some simple models to say where should tips break evens be and where should the ten year note yield be. And using those simple models, you end up seeing right now, for example, ten year note yield should be closer to two percent. And so maybe that is going to be the trigger. And you know when the yield is able to meet and or exceed where risk assets are placing them, that'll finally be the point at which they matter. Um, that's 2% uh, on 10 years. If you look at 10-year TIPS break-evens, risk assets say that they should be closer to 250 basis points. So we got another 20 basis points or so to go from there. And getting back to kind of this global rebound story, uh, if you look at, again, the six months prior to these uh, global rebounds, which there's you know been well over a dozen of them since 1960. Again, measuring uh, using OECD CLIs, we want better than 50% of them uh, rising or growing above trend. Um, and if you compare the current scenario, which uh, would be looking back to September, you know we're almost 70 uh, or so basis points wider on 10-year TIPS break-evens. We can compare that to again this pre-1995 and post-1995 uh, scenario, and you can see that. Uh, that we have a chart, I'm not sure if we're able to get it up. 10-year uh, TIPS break-evens are following that pre-1995 scenario where we could see potentially um, TIPS break-evens continue to widen. And in those cases, we've seen an additional widening on the order of 60 to 70 basis points, which means we would be getting closer to 300 basis points potentially on TIPS break-evens, which again, sounds like a long shot, but you got to remember too, now investors are starting to price in that right side tail for the first time in a long time. We have investors, if you look at inflation swap caps and floors, saying that two and a half percent year over year inflation is becoming a potential reality over the next two to five years. Those probabilities are above 50%. That's why we have an inverted tips break even curve like we expected to happen. That's emblematic of the Fed's flexible um, AIT framework and so on. So I think that uh, investors are not ahead of themselves. The, the issue might be maybe they're moving too slowly and that's what has risk assets somewhat comfortable. The big story will be, what's the Fed gonna do about all this? If you look at, again, these global rebound stories back to 1960, we're about a month or two months away from when short-term interest rates being, being the three month yield begins to actually appreciably climb. Uh, and that is the thing that's likely not going to happen. Like Jim said, 
they're not going to announce pol any major policy changes, either you know any kind of yield curve control or the other way, getting more hawkish. Um, uh, what they'll probably do is say, okay, we're going to keep the um, dot low for 2023, maybe no hikes. We'll raise the growth expectation, maybe that six to eight and a half percent mark. And that means three month yields have to remain lower for longer than people expect. And that also means the curve could remain steeper uh, and essentially not reach that pinnacle point uh, that happens when the Fed does get hawkish, like we've seen with past scenarios. Uh, so we kind of have to be ready potentially for a further steepening and maybe yields need to play quicker catch up and they're not moving quick enough again. And that's why, again, risk assets maybe are okay with it because they're just not keeping pace. I'll just conclude with one quick remark uh, about tips break evens, real rate bonds. Uh, those of you that have listened to the podcast know that I've railed that the tips break evens in the United States are somewhat manipulated because the Fed is a big buyer and a big owner of those break evens or of those real rate bonds. They've bought more than have been issued in the last year, as one just to give you one statistic. That's not the case in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, in Japan, in Europe, uh, Australia, where they have real rate bonds as well, too. Those tips, those inflation break even rates are widening rapidly, as Ben was talking about, to multi year highs. So, there isn't any central bank manipulation in those numbers. So, I take those numbers a lot more seriously than I would take the US numbers because you've removed that central bank uh, manipulation from them. Yeah, let me make a quick final comment about that. I think that's a great point um, and something I didn't really think about because we've talked about how much tips could be, again, manipulated is that tips break even just too wide uh, based on that manipulation. But, you know, every single inflation break even in the 10 year in terms of 10 year outlook i don't care if it's australia japan us we measure 14 different economies they're all wider over the past three months by an average of about 40 to 45 basis points which is the most we've seen post crisis um and it's quite a considerable move so it's it's ubiquitous in nature this isn't your you know kind of oh you know we have these shoots of inflation here and there this is kind of happening on the on the global level which I think calls into question a little bit the globalization teardown. Maybe that won't deteriorate as fast as people think. Um, uh, and uh, and we we'll kind of just have to wait and see if you know these commodity prices continue to rise. The manufacturing revival still hasn't fully translated to the U.S. and eurozone from uh, Asia. So there's, there's still more wood to chop there. Again, a lot of this is still bearish for bonds. Um, so we'll have to see. Yeah, real quick, when you say that the 40 to 45 basis points. It, you know, that every single one of those 14 countries is widened by 40 to 45 basis points is the most since post-crisis. You mean 08, you don't mean last year. And so right. you're talking about 14, you're talking about a 14 year extreme in what we're seeing happen with these numbers. Just want to clarify that. Right. Well, thank you both for your time today. And thank you to our audience for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science. For any questions or to come in, um, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com.